All right. Let me tell you what to do, church. That's my job, right? No, no, no. Tell you what to do. If you disagree with, a, if you find yourself in a heated disagreement, here's what you should do. Get on Facebook, okay, and uh, with, as much, with as much spite as you can muster, tell, tell the people that you disagree with that they're wrong and you're right. They will immediately see the error of their ways. <laughs> they will repent of their wrongdoing, yes? They will, uh, they will acknowledge that, that you are, are right and that they are in fact wrong and, and they will go about redeeming themselves and rebuilding their lives in a much better way. For your part, you will feel a lot better. You'll feel a whole lot more whole, okay, and everything will resolve beautifully. Why are you laughing? You're laughing because it's ridiculous. So why do we keep doing it every day? <laughs> Friends, we are, are continuing our series this week that we've been calling uh, Building on Common Ground, right? In this divided world that we live in, and maybe we're more aware this week than ever of just how divided our world is. In a world like that, what common ground is left, right? Where can we possibly stand together in unity? Well, we talked two weeks ago, Pastor Amy led us in, in talking about uh, the common ground of the importance of relationship and connection. We all hunger for that connection with one another. We talked last week about the timeless love of God, right? The firm ground of God's kingdom, which isn't susceptible to the ebbs and, and flows of human whim. This week I want to talk about our shared humanity, our shared imperfection, all the stuff that comes with that. I have to tell you, we, we laid out the plan for this series several months ago, not recognizing that this topic would fall on this week, uh, right after election day and a very divided uh, election, sort of revealing how, how divided this nation is. So we have to give the spirit credit for that. We didn't plan it that way, but it seems timely. I'd like to look together in order to reflect light on this question at, uh, at Romans chapter 3 reading from Paul, uh, Romans chapter 3, we'll read verses 9 through 24. I'm going to tell you in advance, this is challenging stuff, okay? So prepare yourselves. Take out your pew Bibles if you like. You can follow along there. Those of you at home, uh, take out your Bibles. We'll also put the words up here on the screen if you like to follow along in that way. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. What then? Are we any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin, as it is written. And we're going to get what appears to be a long quotation here. It's actually not a single quotation. It's what's called a katana. You heard the word katana before? Concatenation? It's a, it's a grouping of quotations that come from all over the Old Testament. We have readings here from Psalm 14, 53, Psalm 5, Psalm 140, Psalm 10, Isaiah 59, Psalm 36, all grouped together in this katana. Challenging stuff. Let's read it together. As it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. Their throats are open graves. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Good morning to you too, Paul. <laughs> Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, 
The righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God, and together we say, thanks be to God. I want to tell a story. This comes from, uh, uh, from my own life. It's a story about my dad. I told this story at his funeral, which was four years ago. Some of you might have been here for that. I know some of you were not. Uh, it's one of, uh, one of the, the, the best, I think, stories of his life. He is maybe less the hero of the story. My mother might actually be more the hero of the story, often the case in, in relationships. Uh, but they went to see a show that you've probably heard of, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat, all right, which tells the story, among other things, of the different pathways to peace pursued by Reuben and Judah. Well, they're in the car after seeing the show, coming home, and they're talking about that, reflecting on that and fighting their way through particularly troublesome traffic, really bad traffic. And they got to this, this light, a left turn that was awful. My mom said it was probably six or seven cycles through the, the left arrow, trying to take a left turn there. And, uh, and they made it almost all the way to the front, and then just as they were pulling up to the, to the light, which had turned red right before they got there, a truck came screaming down the center row and cut in right in front of my parents, right there at the red light. And my father, professor of preaching, <laughs> theologian, man of the cloth, people described him as a man of peace. I think he was. That man pursed his lips stepped on the gas, and rammed that truck. <laughs> True story. Well, man got out of his truck and came back, and dad kind of sat there like this, and the man, you know, yelled some choice words at him and everything, and eventually got back in the truck, the light turned green, and they took off, and my parents drove on now in silence. <laughs> Finally, my dad said, you're awfully quiet over there. <laughs> to which my mother replied, Oh, I was just wondering, which pathway to peace was that? <laughs> Round of applause for Brenda Jeter, my mama, right here, yeah. Well, he, here's the confession, okay? I have to confess. Whatever gene that, that it was that provoked my father to do that, I'm pretty sure I inherited two. Uh, I, I, I can't say that I've intentionally rammed any vehicles from behind choir, okay? But, uh, but certainly I have done things in my lifetime, responded in anger and bitterness in ways that I am not proud of. Here's a story that those of you at 9 o'clock didn't get, uh, an example of that perhaps. I was, it was late at night in Chicago, and I pulled into an alleyway okay, trying to, to cut through and make a turn. It was probably 11 o'clock at night. I think I was trying to get home. Uh, that's my story anyway, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I got about two-thirds of the way through this alley, and another car pulled into the alley from the other direction and, and came a third of the way through the alley and stopped, expecting me to move. Well, I was two-thirds of the way through the alley, and they were only a third of the way through the alley. Two and a half hours later, they finally backed out. <laughs> what was that? What was that in my dad that made him step on the gas and ram that? What was that in me that made me sit there for two and a half hours? What, what was that? At best, I'd like to think that there might have been some element of what we call righteous indignation, right? a sense that injustice has been done, a desire for the scales of, of justice to be balanced and for truth to prevail. That's what I'd like to think. But who's truth? <laughs> and where's the line between 
righteous indignation and self-righteous indignation. Was it justice I was concerned with or pride? When I feel, friends, just being honest, when I feel that I have been treated unjustly, that's really, I struggle, that's hard. That is hard for me. I know many of you relate to that. And what tends to happen is that I get stuck in a loop, okay? This this loop that results uh, from that, that indignation and that sense of injustice. And that loop, being stuck in that loop does two things. First of all, it makes the other an enemy, a demon, an object of scorn, unworthy of the love of God. And second, it fills my heart with bitterness and anger that never fails to cut me off from the peace of Christ. What does this text say? This text says something really important. See, it's a, it's a natural thing, I think, as human beings to respond viscerally uh, when we feel that... Uh, that that we've been taken advantage of, or somebody we love has been taken advantage of. But if we then equate ourselves with everything good in the world and make the other out to be the Antichrist, that's a setup. It's a setup, church, even if a real injustice has been committed. Here are the words of N.T. Wright, scholar I admire, brilliant scholar. He says this, So many Christians, eager for the great acceptance, the astonishing welcome of the gospel. Those are good things, by the way. This is a church that values humility and and dignity and hospitality. These are good things. And so many Christians, eager for those things, use this as a reason for denying human sinfulness. But if humans are not deeply sinful, the gospel is no longer astonishing. Indeed, it's not good news at all, since there is no problem to which the gospel is the shocking, startling answer, right? Those who turn a blind eye, this is hard, but it's good. Those who turn a blind eye to wickedness are always in danger of perpetuating and perpetrating it. At the same time as postmodernity, he writes, is urging us to question everything. I think that's a, it's a good thing to question everything. That's, that's the call of postmodernity. But there's a flip side to that, right? At the same time as postmodernity is urging us to question everything, the imperative it sanctions to be true to oneself, even though oneself is constantly shifting and changing, is deeply suspect. Tyrants, bullies, extortioners, adulterers, and murderers are all being true to themselves. And those who look at such activities and thank God that they are not like that need once more to go deeper to examine the secrets of their own hearts. What does the text say, friends? All, all people, both Jews and Gentiles, are under the power of sin. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. We are all flawed. We are all imperfect. We are all sinners. We're all human, right? We're fine with the message of sinfulness as long as it's being applied to our enemy, right? We, we'd, much, we'd much rather have the message that, that you are good, which is not untrue. You are created in the image of God, the imago dei. You are a divine image bearer, worthy of of dignity and love. That is all 100% true. And, And if that's all we ever hear, you're good, you're good, you're good, you're good, you're good. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, I'm so good. Right? It can puff us up in pride and make us think we're incapable of being wrong. It can reinforce the narrative that anybody who disagrees with us must be evil. And that's not a healthy place to be, church. We're all flawed. We're all sinners, okay? And I I I scan the whole room. Don't anybody come to me next week and say, why were you looking at me when you said we're all... (laughs) Y'all too. (laughs) You get bonus points for being up here, but we're, we're all still sinners, 
And it's when we stand on that ground together, recognizing our imperfection, our shared imperfection, that we can see ourselves more honestly. We can see others more graciously. And perhaps it's then and only then that we recognize the true impact of Paul's message here when he says, what? That we all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Jesus. So go back to that moment right, right before you stepped on the gas, right before you pressed post on that Facebook message. Go back to that, that moment of anger and bitterness and hatred when you find yourself in conflict with another. And let's discuss three practical things here that I think come out of this, this text and this call uh, that are possible in and through Christ. First of all, let, let me just acknowledge before we do these three things, it's important to say that none of these things replace the importance of getting out of there and getting help if you're being abused, okay? We're not, we're not trying to foster abuse. Abuse is not okay, period. And if, if that's your situation, you get out and you get help. If you need help, you let us know. Call me, okay? We'll figure it out together. Having said that, three things that we can do through the grace of God in Christ in the midst of conflict. One, Recognize that you're a sinner too. Okay? Recognize that you're a sinner too. And what does that do? Verse 19, it silences every mouth. That's what Paul says. It's a chance to take stock of yourself. Okay? What's, what's this anger really about? Right? Um, maybe, maybe this gives you the opportunity... To, to recognize ways you've hurt somebody else. Have you done the same thing to somebody else that this person just did to you? Maybe this is an opportunity to, to go and, and, uh, and apologize to someone you need to apologize to. Second, you recognize, oh, it's so hard to see this, you recognize that the other in this situation is a human being too. They are a human being too, they have their own hurt. They are beat down by the challenges of life in many of the same ways that you might be, right? Maybe they're being awful and spiteful. They probably didn't wake up in the morning saying, I think I'm going to be awful and spiteful today, <laughs> right? Nobody tries to be that. We're just imperfect and we're flawed and we mess up. Maybe, maybe there's mental illness involved, Maybe the person's just having a bad day, okay? I don't know, but the important thing is to do the best you can, and it's so hard, but it's so important, to do the best you can to look at that person and try to look at them as God looks at them, okay? A person that is broken and flawed and beloved, beloved in the eyes of God, and from that point, third, okay, from that point, if there is accountability that needs to be offered, we do the best that we can to offer that accountability from that place, okay, from that place of, of hopefully greater mutual love and understanding. Love and accountability are not mutually exclusive. Say that again. Say it with me. Love and accountability are not mutually exclusive. Love and codependency are not the same thing. Some of you know what I'm talking about there. That person may have some work to do. They may have work to do. They might need to be lovingly told so. Only God can judge the worth of a human being. But sometimes we might need to judge some actions and choices. Say, you know what? That's just not okay. What you're doing is not okay. You're hurting people. You're hurting people. You're hurting yourself. I'm not going to stand by and just watch that happen, okay? I will, I will stand with you as you do the work or create space for you to do the work, right? Right? I will work on myself even as I call you to work on yourself. We suffer together. We learn together. We grow together. 
most amazing story I've seen in this Veterans Day week was the story of two men, Eric Lomax and Nagase Takashi. Uh, Lomax was serving in, in Southeast Asia many decades ago. He was, he was captured. He was a prisoner of war there in Southeast Asia. And he was put to work on a chain gang, basically trying to build a, a bridge and, and a road through a densely forested area. And Nagase Takashi was, was one of the men responsible for overseeing that group, and specifically for torturing the men as they worked. Okay? And they did. Uh, Nagase Takashi broke Mr. Lomax's arms, his hip, forced water down his throat, trying to force a confession, and drove him right to the edge of death. He, he miraculously survived. He lived. And after the war was over, Mr. Lomax was recruited to be part of a team hunting down his captors and making them pay. He found all of them except for one, Mr. Takashi. For 50 years, Mr. Lomax searched for Mr. Takashi. As, as he says, with a growing bitterness and resentment and anger in his heart. Finally, he found him. He found him, and he went to confront him. And a miraculous thing happened. See, it turned out that Mr. Takashi, over that 50-year period, had been in a constant state of grief over what he had done. As soon as the war ended, something shifted in him, and he couldn't believe what he had done. He asked for God's forgiveness. He cried every day. He had nightmares and PTSD, just like Mr. Lomax did. So when Mr. Takashi found out that Mr. Lomax wanted to meet him, he went, expecting that, that this would be his day to die. And as they met on that bridge that Mr. Lomax helped to build, Mr. Takashi broke down in tears and ran into Mr. Lomax's arms. Mr. Lomax instinctively put his arms around him, and then something shifted in him. And the two became brothers, fast friends. They lived, I think one of them lived 18 more years, and every year for those 18 years, they would get together and they would grieve together. And they discovered that they had so much in common. Their PTSD, their, their nightmares, their grief, their love, their sense that, that they were held by a love greater than they. The story inspired a film called The Railway Man. Friends, this stuff is not easy. This is hard stuff. I, I think it's maybe one of the single hardest things about the journey of Christian faith, right? Right? It's hard, and in this hard way is life. Vengeance cannot and will not break the cycle of sin and hate, but the way of Christ can, and that is exactly what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, when he says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, if someone slaps you on the face, turn the other cheek also. You lose yourself to your rage, it doesn't matter whether you win the argument or not. You've already lost. But when you respond in authenticity, in self-awareness, in love, regardless of the outcome, you win. Because that process itself is life. Thanks be to God. 